Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Francis Family Foundation, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Mara Sale. Our show's called Arts Upload, and this week we are surrounded by sound. At the Mar Sound Archives on the campus of UMKC. With some stories about a guy named Shakespeare. And the Ensemble America. Some more about Downton Abbey and the art of chocolate. It's all ahead on the Upload. Last month marked the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death. To commemorate that milestone, the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. decided to do something pretty epic. From their collection of first folios, that is, printed editions of Shakespeare plays dating back to the 1620s, they're sending a copy to one location in every state. Starting June 5th for four weeks, that location will be the Missouri Valley Room in the Kansas City Public Library downtown. As summer approaches, it's pretty much going to be all Shakespeare all the time in these parts. Here's a look at how Show Me Shakespeare has been coming together. I think it's sort of like if the Mona Lisa were to travel the country or the U.S. Constitution were to come to every state. They wanted to. It's interesting to see the families that have come. Yesterday, there were some people visiting the folio, and the mother said to me, my children dragged me here. You see the brown there? That's the binding. It's, it's interesting to sort of see what gets people most excited about the book. Sometimes I think it's just being able to read it for themselves and to read that to be or not to be speech and to sort of look at how letters used to be different. By now, you've probably deduced that this isn't Missouri's copy of the first folio. It's the one that went to the Little Apple, Manhattan, Kansas, back in February. It spent four weeks at the Beach Museum of Art there. Much like here, the run-up to that stay was filled with different manifestations of the impact the Bard's work still has today. In Kansas City, Show Me Shakespeare was officially launched more than four months ago at the Plaza Branch, with a script-in-hand reading of Much Ado About Nothing. Be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. <laughs> Be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I think Shakespeare is incredibly important and also incredibly rich and fun. What light through yonder window breaks? Oh, it is my lady, it is my love. How's that? The director of the Kansas City Public Library got hooked on Shakespeare back in his teens. And while we don't have photographic evidence of his bowling brook in Richard II, there is documentation of a much younger banker's role in helping co-found the Heart of America Shakespeare Festival. It's still going strong 24 years later in South Moreland Park. Last year, it was King Lear. This year, Twelfth Night. Not surprisingly, that organization has also played a major role in the first folio frenzy. Thirteen events in all including this recent tutorial for youngsters on the art of stage combat. Palm to the ground. Uh, that workshop that Colin was teaching is one of our most popular workshops. Uh, go figure, kids love whacking each other with swords, so. <laughs> Physicality may be the name of this game, but for kids ready to tackle the plays themselves, there's an ever-expanding roster of camp and team Shakespeare opportunities that Matt Rapport oversees. Once they sort of get the key and figure out how to understand it, it opens up to them, just like it did for me, you know, and I see that happen. I'm lucky enough to see that happen with kids all the time. I think I've become a better Shakespearean actor from teaching Shakespeare to kids and seeing the revelations they have and the insights they have that I might have overlooked just because of where I am in life as opposed to where they are, you know. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Like Grace Goheen from Blue Valley High School. 
whose Joan of Arc took the honors at the annual English-speaking Union Shakespeare competition, earning her the right to represent Kansas City in the finals at Lincoln Center. This year, perhaps boosted by the focus on the folio, 18 contestants came from schools around the metro to perform a scene and sonnet. The language that we speak is Shakespeare's language. And it's important because there's still no one in the history of our literature who could appeal to the groundlings and to the boxes, to, who, who gave us kings and clowns, uh, who gave us uh, the, the, the highest and the lowest of, uh, of what humanity is all about. Most historians agree that our all-time greatest American actor was Edwin Booth, who had begun his career on tour with his father, Junius Brutus. Competitions Booth. and performances are just part of the menu that library patrons have been feasting on in anticipation of the folio's arrival. In April, dramaturge Felicia Landre brought her encyclopedic knowledge of the ways that Shakespeare's plays first came to these shores. When a troop led by William Forbes was attacked by Seminole Not Indians. always without incident. Two actors were killed, but the company's real setback was the Indians' appropriation of their costume stock. Dr. Landre will return this summer to offer up the controversial theory that someone other than Shakespeare might have written the plays. That question, and everything else under the sun, is what these docents in training have been prepping for, while getting college credit through a special English course at UMKC. They all had to pay to take the class, and they all did, so they're basically paying in order to be trained to volunteer. This is a great instance, though, where students have learned something in the classroom and can bring it to bear you know, meeting with the public, sharing what they know, and they really do know things. Today, they're learning the layout here on the fifth floor of the Central Library, where the folio will reside in the Missouri Valley Room from June 6th through the 28th. The case will have two separate alarms on it. One will be a shock sensor. So if someone bumps that case pretty hard, it's going to set off the alarm, which actually... Operations manager Jerry Hutchins is alarm. filling them in on some of the basics the and showing us the technology to help ensure the iconic document stays safe and secure. This is actually Missouri Valley. This is the center where the folio is going to be. This is actually a 360, so on the computer we can actually pull this thing down and look all the way around the room with it. A deep breath when you heard that it was going to come on board? Not in the beginning, but the closer it got, yeah, it starts to become real and you start to realize, oh, wow, this is, this is, this is big stuff. With only 233 copies in existence, it is indeed big stuff not only for scholars, but ultimately for all of us. If we didn't have this book, we would only have half of Shakespeare's output and many of the best-known plays, best-loved plays, Macbeth, The Tempest, series of others, we would, would be completely lost. It really is sort of an extraordinary moment when, uh, f with Ben Jonson and Shakespeare, roughly simultaneously, we, we have playwrights who are thought to be literature. English literature and the English language really are created in this few years uh, of the early 17th century. A quick glance at the library's brochure confirms that with one program after another, June will essentially be all Shakespeare all the time. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. So it's only fitting the month begins with a special edition of Meet the Past, whose guest has been gone for, well, 400 years. And I will get to ask him some tough questions about why he left his only his second best bed uh, to his wife in his will, about whether or not he really wrote the plays, um, you know, what it was, what it was like hanging out at uh, the court of Queen Elizabeth, um, and uh, whether or not he participated in the Essex Rebellion. Should be a good night of uh, back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III grilling William Shakespeare will air on KCBT Thursday, June 16th at 7.30 p.m. As part of the run-up to the folio's arrival, the Bach aria soloist played some historically appropriate classical music in the library. Bo Bledsoe is the guitarist for that group, but he also leads another one that explores some different musical turf. It's called Ensemble Iberica. Producer Ashley Holcroft has more on the cross-cultural contributions they've been making. <laughs> Thank you.
It's well into the evening on Cinco de Mayo in the West Bottoms. But inside, the ship is swaying to the sultry sounds of the ensemble. Tonight featuring Fedra Cooper Barrera. Ensemble Iberica was founded in 2013. At its core, Bo Bledsoe, Michael McClintock, and Jordan Shipley. The mission is to perform music from Iberia, which is Portugal and Spain, and all of their former colonies. And it's not really time specific. It could be a medieval music or Baroque music. It could be Islamic music from uh, southern Spain. Also be uh, modern tango music. Or uh, romantic boleros. It's not really time specific or location specific, but it all relates back to that uh, peninsula of, of Iberia. A native of Arkansas, Bo moved to Kansas City for graduate school at the UMKC Conservatory in 1993. But it was something else entirely that made him want to stay. I had a buddy here at the uh, Art Institute and he would take me to those late night juke joints that would stay open all night. And so I decided this was a city for me. So. And it was at the conservatory that he began his love affair with the music of colonial Spain and Portugal. I was playing a lot for like the flamenco dance classes and there was a guy uh, in there from Guanajuato, Mexico and he would take me to his family home in, in Mexico. And that's kind of where my deep interest in Mexican music started. And uh, just over many years, I started going to, to Argentina and Spain more often, and of course Portugal, and um, studying those different musics within their own social contexts. And that's really been my uh, artistic process ever since. Nowadays, his travels are uniquely beneficial to audiences here. We have the sister cities of Kansas City, Sevilla, Spain. So we're always going there, and we'll stay there for a little while, and we'll perform there, and then we'll bring back artists from there, and the same with, uh, with Lisbon. So I, I like to set up these, uh, it's like a, a groove in a, a record or something, you know, like a, a stylus and a piece of clay. The more it goes back and forth, the, the deeper the relationship gets between the, the two cities. I'm a, a conservatory-educated uh, musician, but I think I've gotten more out of just going to little small towns and uh, studying with real masters in certain genres, playing in different festivals and, and in people's homes, and you know, you're eating the food and playing with the kids, and you know, all of that has to do with how the music sounds. You know, like for instance, how a uh, a mother were, will call their child to come in for dinner at night, you know, has a, a certain musical sound to it. You know, Argentine tango sounds and looks like Buenos Aires. Uh, Portuguese fado is very much a Lisbon thing that feels like that town and they're, they're very much uh, married together. So if you go there and stay there for a long time, it'll inform the music much more than, say, uh, reading a book or uh, taking classes at a conservatory. Whether it's in Guanajuato, Mexico, or here locally, the ensemble has benefited greatly from cultivating partnerships, as seen in their 2016 lineup. This time, it was with the Owen Cox Dance Group and tenor Nathan Grainer for a concert in celebration of Spanish dance to be performed at Johnson County Community College just days from this rehearsal. Oh, that feels right.
From recital halls to the middle of the MAP Music Festival, the goal for what Ensemble Iberica wants to bring to their audience is clear. I want them to feel like they've experienced something that they would not normally experience in Kansas City, like they've kind of gone on a little trip. You know, I want them to make a personal relationship with a different kind of music. And then, of course, I want them to come back, which we've been really lucky with. We have a very good uh, repeat audience, and it grows every season. Music of all kinds is preserved here at the Mars Sound Archives inside the Miller Nichols Library at UMKC. It started with historical recordings that a teacher named Gaylord Marr donated in the 80s, and it's just been growing wildly ever since. Jazz collections, old radio archives from KMBC, Walt Bodine's recorded legacy, all kinds of things that just keep coming in as Chuck Haddock's, yep, the guy from the fish fry, keeps finding more cool stuff to preserve. It's fun to look through vintage recording gear and maybe most of all watch the robot retrieval system in action. They're here weekdays till 4.30 and weekends by appointment. Now from the world of audio back to video and the phenomenon known as Downton Abbey. As the series was heading toward its final episode last winter, it was also becoming a full-fledged Rose Parade participant. Here's how a TV masterpiece becomes a floral one. We've never had a flow. This is the very first, and it's so exciting for us not only to be here to pay tribute to Downton Abbey, but also knowing that we've won the Queen's Trophy. We found out uh, in midsummer time that PBS was going to be featuring a Downton Abbey float in the Rose Parade. And at that point, our client list was just about full. And I was nervous, do I want to take on another float? And I thought, it's Downton Abbey. How could I possibly say no to Downton Abbey? One of our favorite things about building these floats is being able to actually work face to face with the participants, with people from the sponsoring organizations. Well, we get volunteers that come from all over the world. We have lots of bucket listers, people that come in because they've always wanted to, it's on their list. We have, there's two women from Illinois who had always wanted to work on a float and when they saw it was the Downton Abbey float, they booked their reservations and they've been here all week and plan to be here all week. I watched uh, two gentlemen today very carefully make lima bean mosaics that are on the base of all of the, uh, the large planters. Uh, and women were laying navy beans in little tiny circles that will be 100% covers with flowers and leaves. Each float has uh, 60 volunteers per shift three plus shifts a day. So we have on average 200 people a day that will work on a float. One of the unique features of this entry is that it's going to include a large number of English garden roses. Uh, those are not seen in the Rose Parade very often because they're so delicate. Uh, they really only have a vase life of four or five days, which for us is very short. You think about the time they're cut from the bush, the time it takes them to get to us, and then they, we, they have to go on to the float. It's only a very narrow window that we have to keep those roses looking beautiful and camera ready on parade day. So uh, we're bending over backwards though because we want this float to have that real English garden feel that would be fitting of Downton Abbey. This is so far beyond I could have imagined. I mean, the whole idea of having a float built, and building it out of all these beautiful flowers, particularly all these amazing roses, and, and really celebrating what has been such a significant part of PBS. PBS uh, thought about what sort of car it was going to be that was out in front of the castle long and hard, and they ended up asking for a 1919 Bentley a Blue Label 3-liter Tourer, and that is what we have reproduced as specifically as we can on this float. 
sitting inside the car, the inside of the car is also finished as well as the outside. I mean, it's just every detail. The, the irises that are the water on the side that have all were, were all hand opened. I mean, it's just the amount of love and attention and creativity and volunteer hours that went into creating this is just is just mind blowing. And then, of course, the passion for Downton Abbey is uh, just everywhere. Uh, when Downton Abbey came along, I was hooked from the very first episode, and so it's a very special treat to be able to participate just in a tiny way uh, with that Downton Abbey success. I mean, I feel quite emotional because I see this and I think back to that very first scene I had shooting with Maggie Smith in a garden and a little bench like this, and the leap from that day when we were just doing a tiny little TV show that we wouldn't expect anyone to see to, to having 60,000 flowers represented on a float has been such a, a miracle uh, that I'm really emotional about that as well. As we put the finishing touches on another arts upload, how about a quick taste of chocolate? Artistically rendered chocolate from a Pakistani woman who started out to be a lawyer. Take a look at these beautiful and delicious works of art from Houston's Annie Rupani. Chocolate is such a great medium for all spices and fruits. And I don't think many people have ever explored that. I started off with cardamom. That was the first spice that I ever used, and I made it cardamom rose. And so it was a white chocolate ganache infused with cardamom, a little bit of rose water, and dark chocolate on the outside. So that just opened up a whole world of anything that I tried at a restaurant I wanted to try in chocolate. My name is Annie Rupani, and I am a chocolate artist. Cacao is the fruit that chocolate comes from. Ironically enough, like the English language is the only one that turned cacao into cocoa. So very few people actually make the connection between cacao and cocoa, but it's essentially the same thing. The raspberry pistachio is dark and white, but it's delicious. Chocolate was one of those like interim things that I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna play with chocolate and try to figure out, well, where am I going? And I was studying six days a week and then I started taking a day off and playing with chocolates, reading artisanal books on chocolate. And that led to me going to pastry school in Malaysia. I never woke up and said, I'm going to be a chocolatier. It just all sort of came into place. Initially, we started off by coloring the molds. Cocoa butter is the fat that's in chocolate, and we paint the molds with cocoa butter. The second step would be creating a shell inside of the mold. So we're trying to create a really thin shell. So when you bite into the chocolate, you have a crisp bite and then you just get overwhelmed by the ganache, which will melt in your mouth. Ganache is basically an emulsion between cream and chocolate. It could be any liquid in chocolate. So you can make a water ganache or you can make a coconut milk ganache. And so we play with a lot of that. We make cream ganaches, which are the most normal. And then we also make fruit puree based ganaches. We also do coconut milk ganaches. So after we're done making our ganaches, which is where all the fun happens with the infusions and fruit, and then we pipe the ganache. We'll pipe it into the shell and let that set. And then we'll add another layer of chocolate to finish off the chocolate and stick it in the freezer for about 10 to 15 minutes so that it releases from the mold. The Buddha is a really popular. It's a Chinese spice spice praline. So it's a hazelnut praline with Chinese spice spice. There's milk chocolate on the inside and white on the outside. Chocolate is so interesting, just like coffee or wine. There's terroir that affects the way that chocolate tastes. So Colombian chocolate tastes different than Venezuelan chocolate. That'll taste different than Bolivian chocolate. So the chipotle will be dark. The um, s'mores, none of them are solid. They're all like they all have an interior, like a ganache in the center. It's so accessible. Chocolate is on every candy bar. It's around when you grow up. It's just a part of everyday life. It's almost a category of its own. And I love the Sichuan peppercorn. Yeah, it's very unique. People are a little scared of it, but, but not me. it always surprises them. <laughs> there is something associated with chocolate and happiness.
Wow, chocolate and flowers, some sultry Spanish music, even a little bit of Shakespeare. I think our work here is pretty much done. It is. And as we close things out at the Mars Sound Archives, we'll say so long for the summer. But we'll be back. Yep. Arts Upload will crank back up again in September. Till then, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Mara Sailor. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Francis Family Foundation, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and by viewers like you. Thank you.